James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Peter Max is a graphic artist who aspires to do visually what the Beatles have done for music. Whether he has succeeded or not may depend upon your age and taste in art. But one thing is certain, the products of his lively imagination are as ubiquitous as advertising. They show up in fabrics, household products, package design, neckties, car cards, and even the Manhattan telephone directory. As a consequence, Peter Max has not only become a pop culture hero to the young, he has become what some have described as a hippie millionaire, a curious combination of successful businessman and oriental mystic. Peter, there's almost no place you can go in this world where you aren't confronted, whether you wish to or not, with something that's a product of your own imagination. It's really very widespread, as you know. You said at one time, it's not me covering the world. It's some great cosmic force. What is that cosmic force? I think it's the life within me that I experience from moment to moment. That's what it is. Hmm. Uh, feeling life, being here, and letting it happen as it happens, letting it actually come out the moment it's coming out, not working up towards a mood, but being the mood being, of the moment. Being the mood. Being the mood mm -hmm. of that moment, dealing with, being it, not working with it mm -hmm. or around it, but actually going through it, hmm. not trying to bypass it. How does, how does this force manifest itself? It's yeah. life. It's the same thing. It's like intuition. You know, when you have intuition, when you walk down the street, you see something nice, or you fall in love, or you are in a meadow and you see beautiful flowers and you get inspiration. It's those same moods that go through me, mm -hmm. just standing in front of a canvas or in front mm -hmm. of a concept. And uh, I just become that, and then I articulate it mm -hmm. and make it happen and dispatch my ideas to mm -hmm. assistants. Does it go so through so you well. because you're Peter Max, or could it go through me as well? I think it's there all the time. Mm -hmm. We as individuals pick it all up. Mm -hmm. it's whatever's coming through me is available for you, and whatever's coming through you is available to me, except I think our individualities, according to who we are, mm -hmm. pick it up differently. We're all the same. There's one God, and we all are aspects of that mm -hmm. variety. There's, there's many varieties. But as an individual, we also have the individual qualities. All the varieties are made of a lot of of a lot of individual aspects, so we choose individually mm -hmm. to take that part in and, and bring it well, out. Well, you were saying earlier that you, uh, <coughs> you, you have the capacity of receiving your ideas almost as, as a, a, a complete unit, mm -hmm. that it's not just a part of an idea, but you're, and you're able to dispatch people to, <coughs> to, do, to do the work that needs done growing out of this single idea. That seems to me to be fairly unusual. Most of us, I think, tend to think only in parts of, uh, uh, of an idea and go to s experts in other areas to, mm. to do the rest of it. Well, I, I live mm. with it, so it's not unusual to me, but I can walk into a room, a big hall, it could be a concert hall, it could be Radio City Music Hall. If they would ask me to, let's say, redo it, um, the ideas would start flowing and I could dispatch my ideas to a number of people writing uh, ideas, mm. and most probably there'll be not a corner that I haven't covered. I'll cover every side which will go from the color com combinations to what has to be done first and second and third, you know, having production in mind, to the promotional uh, repercussions of it. It's just an understanding. It's, the, it's really understanding the media. Suppose, let's say, an artist uh, uh, during the turn of the century or before had an idea, so he, had a, he knew where to get his paper, he knew where to get his paint, what to grind up and where to set up mm -hmm. his easel. 
today living in the 20th century, all the paints and all the easels are all there. So if I have an idea that entails something larger than my canvas, something that's in 3D, like an environment, like the Times Square area or the Grand Canyon or something, it's the same concept except it, while, while it doesn't end on the canvas, it ends out there. So the ideas come fully equipped. Well, you're going to do, you mentioned uh, uh, Times Square and the Grand Canyon. I don't know about the Grand Canyon, but you are going to do something about Times Square. Yes. Now, this, this goes way beyond what I think of as a canvas. I mean, uh, yes. It requires, I should think, a knowledge of a great many fields, yes. but you are not particularly well trained. Uh, what are you going to do with Times Square? Well, I'm trying to do the best in renovating Times Square, to turn it from dark to light. Uh, fortunately, I got involved in the um, purchase of the Allied Chemical Building with Alex Parker. I came up with a concept of taking a building. This is the old building on which the ball drops on New Year's Eve. Right. For those who don't live in New York, I may not recognize the Allied Chemical Building. Mm -hmm. It's right at the at, at the point. Crossroads of the world. Yes. <laughs> and then in the center of the building is this long well they call it that has this long picture. Anyhow, and a new sign goes around. That building is mine as a piece of k kinetic art, let's say. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, art, it's mine to express myself artistically, <coughs> but reasonably, logically, and in the time and space of today. Mm -hmm. It's not something to do a pie-in-the-sky idea with. This is to deal, it's a Times Square building that deals with Times Square. So we will set an example in Times Square as what should happen in Times Square. Mm -hmm. Already, Lindsay uh, offered us 26 billboards to, to yeah. redo. And there are all these the various other manifestations that go down the avenue. Mm -hmm. Will it be done in, in what I suppose many people come to think of as the Peter Max style, the kind of up, joyous, Art Nouveau drawing that you've done in the past? Not, not really. Uh, it'll be up and joyous, but it will not necessarily be represented in, in drawings that are uh, joyous, in other words, mm -hmm. my, my flying cosmic characters. They, they might not appear anywhere in the mm -hmm. building. But the concepts are of, 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 a, of a very large magnitude. We have some of those uh, flying uh, characters that I might take a look at for if there's anybody, I can't believe there is, anybody who's not acquainted with what we're talking about in connection with mm -hmm. what I think of as the Peter, Peter Max style. Right. But uh, uh, how, how do you describe it? Well, it's my, um, let me just say this, the fir first of all, throughout my f last five, ten years, it's really a, a surrealistic type of art that I do. And these flying cosmic characters that fly in and out of rainbows and out of skies and that smile in blue and boats with reflection, is very surrealistic, except it's a very up surrealism. Mm -hmm. uh, surrealism gets a, tends to get very weird sometimes. So I'm, I'm, you know, if sometimes you see a painting of surrealism, let's say by Dali, and there's this big streak of light coming yeah. from the clouds. If you were going to open it with a little razor blade and peek in there, I might be in there doing all those <laughs> colorful <laughs> kind of things. But it is surrealism. But because I somehow was able to manifest its, this art form really down into the butter dishes and into the bed sheets and towels yeah. of, of the people, it now came out of surrealism into realism. They lived with it every day. I see. So it's a very strange phenomenon. I personally had experience because it is s surrealism that I love. Let me ask you about your life, because uh, one would think, in looking back upon it, it doesn't reflect what you've just said. You were born in Berlin, as a matter of fact, and uh, your family left Berlin when you were fairly young, did they not, and went to Shanghai, and they fled because of the Nazis. Now, this is not, it may be surrealistic, but it's hardly up. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess I've had my down, and now it's time for something up. I mean, yeah. life comes in, you know, in blocks of mm -hmm. darknesses and light. My parents did have a hard time um, uh, leaving Germany, but actually when we arrived in China, I grew up in, in a world that, uh, I mean, looking back now, I really am very thankful for his grace mm -hmm. of putting me through that. Because Why? Well, 12, 12 years for somebody who maybe was originally artistic, as I I always, this is my life, to grow up in a culture that's 8,000 years old, where every scent in the street and every move of everybody and all the gestures of the people and all the colors and the melodies are so sophisticated and they're so well balanced and they already went through the yin and yang and what's good and what's evil and it's all a romantic life, you know, painted according to Confucius or to the I Ching or whatever, mm -hmm. King Wen. So there I was, you know, 
three months old growing up in all of this. And so even though finally after China we, we went all around Africa and, and Israel and finally came to America, this How long was this Africa and Israel uh, four sojourn. more years? Four years. Four so more it years had a of considerable impact upon yes, your, your really, connection. Yes, really, really interesting. But so here, you know, even though uh, at first view, you know, there's a, a Caucasian body, there's mm -hmm. a lot of culture that's Oriental inside. In other words, I have an instinctive reaction to uh, to uh, to the smell of instant, incense, mm -hmm. or to seeing a Swami, or to seeing the Hare Krishna people mm -hmm. in the street. I know very deeply what that is about, and mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Now, a lot. Your, your schooling in Shanghai was not in a Chinese school, obviously. No. And your father was a rather well-to-do merchant, was he not? Yes. So that he your contact with this was was peripheral to your life, rather than central to it, I assume. The Chinese. The Chinese. Well, uh, living, living in China, life. you know, yeah. you every morning, and my uh, a rickshaw person would come and pick mm -hmm. me up and take me to school, and I would have my favorite places where I would get my yeah. Chinese little uh, dumplings on the street, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. you would over here with Frankfurt mm -hmm. and pizza. I had my little places that I, I've gotten. It's written about you that your interest in uh, art came first from the Buddhist monks in China, is that yeah. true? Yeah, right where I used to live, uh, one of the places before the Japanese occupation, I l we lived in this fabulous place, it was a villa that my father bought very inexpensively because he we were from Europe, you know, mm -hmm. with a little money, but there was a lot of money there. And he bought this fabulous vi villa where little Peter can run around and be on his bicycle. I still remember him telling me the stories. But right mm -hmm. across the fence from where we lived was a Buddhist monastery where I had my first uh, touch with Eastern, uh, cult uh, Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. And there were these artists, probably martial artists, who used to do brush paintings on the floor. Yeah. And it used to fascinate me how they used to take these big brushes and they just used to like wipe these brushes around and draw these mm -hmm. fabulous things on the floor, you know, just with four strokes, a bird this big. But I didn't get involved in it yet. The chanting and the incense that used to come every day when mm -hmm. the wind was right into, our, into uh, my house. And then when we moved, there was another house and that house was across the street from a Hindu uh, oh. sh a sheik, you know, the sheiks that wear the yes. turbans, right. a Hindu temple. So again, the incense and the prayer all day while I was sleeping, and at five in the morning, it used to come into my life. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of you know a cultural um, um, training mm -hmm. that came sort of in my sleep. It's a tremendous cultural leap, it seems to me, from Shanghai to Africa to Israel to Brooklyn right. and to Madison Avenue. But it's yeah. a leap you made. Brooklyn through the Pratt Institute uh, and yeah, uh, mostly the Art Students League. Art Students League, and uh, f fairly quickly. You were into Madison yeah. Avenue, weren't yeah. you, and uh, into a firm, a, a partnership where you did graphics. Yeah, for, for we I came out of art school and worked for a fairly famous art studio in town for a few weeks, and then I opened my art, own art studio and got involved in Madison Avenue again at a very nice place because here I was dealing with not one agency but with a hundred mm -hmm. because I was a design studio, freelancing graphics. So I learned all about media and all about public relations and advertising and budgets and corporations, all through that. You and, did, and you did very well. You won quite a few awards, as I recall, yeah. in the first two years of doing this. Yeah. What, was the, what was the magic that uh, made it so successful commercially? Again, I think what it was that I have that little English in my life from the Orient that makes my graphic presentation a little different. In other words, somebody wants it and I have just all this background that's Eastern. But it's still Eastern and digested with my Western background and having been born in Berlin, Germany, my mm -hmm. parents who come from big cities, you know, and having lived in Berlin, in Shanghai, in Paris, and mm -hmm. the big cities of the world. And now being here, it manifests itself in some other ways. It fuses that. itself in, in, yeah. in, in whatever it is you do. In mm -hmm. fact, when I was uh, in Madison Avenue and I had won over 80 awards and won in about an 18 months period, I was amazed and I was mm -hmm. confused. How come me, all my friends, my buddies I went to school with, mm -hmm. were still... You were amazed. I was mm -hmm. amazed. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it. I knew this stuff was good, mm -hmm. but I thought all my other people that I worked with were good too. But somehow it pulled away. It was different. When I thought it was part of a group. Mm -hmm. So later I... You pulled away. Pulled it, out of that firm, it, didn't it you? Just, yes, I pulled away, mm -hmm. then I went into retreat, and I painted for two years. Why did you pull away and go into retreat? Well, I had enough commercial art for a while, this Madison Avenue art, and then mm -hmm. after two years, I've painted, and I created this uh, style that I sort of brought in from the skies and put it down into the streets, you know, mm -hmm. the cosmic jumper who felt himself everywhere on mm -hmm. this planet. 
And what did you do in those two years? In, in those two years, I just played. You know, I would get up at four in the morning and I would be at my easel in my underwear painting and having breakfast at 10 and then showering and shaving at the time and doing my thing. I just worked all And the output the never dried up? Never. I produced many thousands of pieces of work. Then that period, you know, I, it manifested itself into the corporate level, rather through advertising directly mm -hmm. with the corporations. Mm -hmm. And that went on for about two, three years. And now for the last year and a half, again, I've dropped out. Mm -hmm. I've given up all commercial involvement. You have given it up. Totally. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just involved in things that s interest me in a super artistic way. I paint all day long on my canvases. Mm -hmm. And uh, when a project like Times Square comes that I really feel is an artistic project, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not an architect, I'm not a consultant, I'm just an innovator in, 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 in taking something that's there, that's a monument, and turning it into something that's really fabulous to my mm -hmm. mind. So th that and painting all day is how I occupy my, my whole day. Mm -hmm. as, a, as an innovator or someone who, who um, has these, these, um, this power you spoke of earlier, you apparently have no, you're not troubled with doubts. About whether it's the right thing or not. No, you move ahead. no. There's mm -hmm. a certain place in me that when I move forward and, 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 and the joys mm -hmm. uh, within is, f is felt, it, it feels right. So the doubt would be a barrier if you permitted yeah. it. Yeah. If it, it feels wrong, then it, it would. My, I, if mm -hmm. it, there's no doubt, this, if mm -hmm. it's a joyous feeling, I just move ahead. And it's half. Half the work is creating, stimulating others to work, and the other half is exciting the other people around to like, let's go and do it. You, you must do going. more than that. Huh? D you must do more than that to excite other people around you. It isn't like a cheerleader, I'm sure. No, but it's they see you know how gung ho I am on a project. Now mm -hmm. I just pull out all stops and I pull the canvases and I bring in friends of mine mm -hmm. who are in audiovisual and I just create a whole, and then it's it's there and every everybody mm -hmm. rejoices in it and suddenly a project is born. You can mm -hmm. see everybody in the room is full of excitement, and something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take a look at what it is you're doing now because it is quite a departure from what you've done for commercial yeah. art. What you're doing now uh, is, if I understand you correctly, really fine art. Is that right? Well, it's, fi it's, it's always fine art from where I stand. I mean, it, hasn't, I it hasn't the utilitarian value yeah. of advertising and, and that, c that kind yes. of thing. Yes, what these things are, uh, they are paintings on canvas, but really what they are are just little studies. Mm. I'll pull out a canvas, put it on the easel, and, and paint for a half an hour or two and create something like that or some of the others. And I just paint on them, the, 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 um, the paint flows, you know, the, the, the greasy substance, which is oil or acrylic, merge mm -hmm. in front of my eyes, and my intuitions of picking up red or green or blue happen. Mm -hmm. And a painting occurs right in front of my own eye. Um, without, I see this painting you're looking at wasn't pre-planned. That green and and that gray blending to it white happens in happened. Sense. I mm. did not know that they could have been leaves of a vase. This happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I let it just occur. All I know there's a joyous moment. The paints feel right. The, the, the mood is right. Mm -hmm. And I continue. And then as it comes together and it feels like a vase with flowers, then I sort of try to put my paints, my brushes into the water and walk away. Because mm -hmm. once it feels, it is. So I don't want to over-labor it, and somehow it's it just come out. Mm -hmm. While we're looking at this, this last picture, let me ask you your thoughts on several things, the first of which is money, which you've apparently earned a great deal of through commercial mm -hmm. art. Do you feel that you have the security now with money that you can do the kind of thing you're doing now, or is money still involved? Well, money, money is, is, is energy. It is energy. And uh, it means that uh, one day money meant paying, uh, buying paints, and so another day, money ma means buying groups mm -hmm. and think tanks and working with sophisticated research teams in making my project more real. In other words, I have ideas sometimes, like for instance now, where three years ago, I definitely thought as much as I've caused things you know, out there, you know, with the Peter Max name, mm -hmm. whatever that happened, as much as that happened, there were still ideas I said, Jesus, Never in my life will this ever happen. Mm. It's too far-fetched. Yeah. And today already, just two, three years later, even these ideas are becoming real. It's, it's, and it gives me a tremendous amount of adrenaline and ex mm. excitement. But money has been a, 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 a power in making. Well, uh, the uh, money, when the money comes in in larger quantities, there's larger projects. Of course, that it's the energy. So it's always, it's yeah. the energy. You don't uh, take it for granted then? No, I, I, I tell you, I have a lot of respect for it. I live, I live a very frugal life. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't run around much. and. 
you know, um, it's... Uh, you enjoy spending it not on personal things, then? Not really. I'd like mm -hmm. to give, you know, myself or my family the comfort mm -hmm. you see, and the rest is, is just the personal environment which gives me the right creative output, you know, mm -hmm. gives me the right creative place mentally. Mm -hmm. But the rest is that if I do have an idea and I want to build a city from Massachusetts to Florida, if that's my idea, Maganopolis, that stretches 3,000 or 2,000 miles long, encased in a thousand pyramids, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, in one straight line, if I have this idea to be able to hire the right model makers to take these ideas that I sketch out and build it for me and make this a reality, so when I bring an A Beam or a Lindsay or uh, someone from, from the federal administration down and say, this is my latest creation. It's not just standing there and saying, geez, a creative artist, and look at these yeah. wonderful ideas, but there it is. Mm -hmm. Not only is it on a table in three-dimensional and you can lift off the chunks and see how they live inside, yeah. but there'll be statistics with it. There'll be you know, analysis, because if I'm dealing not with graphics, but I'm dealing with civic and federal things, my media, you know, my brush strokes, have to be that thorough that they understood. Your media is me, so to speak, isn't it? Yes. All of us. Right. You mentioned your family, Peter. Uh, you do have two children, and their names yes. would suggest to me an interest in astrology as well. Well, uh, I named them uh, during the period nine months, uh, nine years ago, when Adam was born and Libra, she she's seven, mm -hmm. and I was at that time going through my heaviest cosmic period. I see. It's the period what, when. What, what is a heavy cosmic? A, period? a heavy cosmic period is is a time in my life when I was interested in swamis and I wanted to know what is it all about? I mean, why am I here? Mm -hmm. What is this? Why do I get up in the morning feeling happy or sad? Mm -hmm. Why? The big mm -hmm. why that nobody yeah. knows. And then I finally found a great swami who at least gave me the notions that through him and his examples and some of the studies I might find out why for myself. Mm -hmm. And I found out why. And I find out now and it's just multiplied my scope of what, w what life and world is all about to understanding that th this little thing here, you know, however little and however great, you know, the, the micro and the, you know, macroism of it is a, an expression of God, who I am. You are. We all are we God. Are. Mm -hmm. See? So we can call ourselves God mm -hmm. knowing, of course, that we are just that aspect like these things can mm -hmm. all call each other fingers. Mm -hmm. We are all, I am the pinky. Mm -hmm. But this pinky knows he's part of a hand. Therefore, mm -hmm. you know, I am an individual aspect. One of, w when they speak about God, you say, uh, God is multifaceted, omnipresent, omnipotent, you know. Mm -hmm. What are the omnis, you know? We are, everyone are these omnis, mm -hmm. the doctors, the scientists, the joyous ones, the suffering ones the ones that are alive, the ones who die, the ones who are great and the ones mm -hmm. who are sad. All of us are experiencing life for God's yeah. sake, you see? And then all his, all his notions and intuitions of God, which we are, it's not really his. It's like mm -hmm. myself, my intuition is that aspect. It's that mm -hmm. growth. Peter, what about fame? You've got considerable fame. Some people say that you will one day be as least as famous as Walt Disney and Norman Rockwell, <laughs> which I find a bit amusing because among young people they'll say, "Who's Norman Rockwell?" And they certainly know yeah. Peter Max. Is fame well, important to you at all? Well, there's two things. Um, fame. I, I now I'm starting to understand what fame is. Fame is that many people recognize you, mm. and they sort of, when you walk into a room, there's a, an attitude, which sometimes can be uh, hard. It's inhibiting rather it's than It's inhibiting liberating. because if I walk into a room, I'm not thinking about myself being famous. It's just mm -hmm. Peter, you know, yeah. Peter humbly walking out of an elevator with a friend, wanting to maybe share some time, mm -hmm. but the people are all prepared for something, you know, different. So ha learning how to deal with that has become another way of life, which occurs occasionally. The other thing is f fame and game go hand in hand. Fame and game. Fame and game. Certain things are for fame, and mm -hmm. certain things are for game. I see. The fame, I guess, is just what is the repercussion, the echo of what one does. It comes back, and if it's really right and touches a lot of souls, it becomes fame. Mm -hmm. The game is what one really does for humanity. In my case, it's for humanity. For somebody could be there is a purpose behind. There all is a this. purpose. I would like to build cities. I would like to show comfort to people. I would like to reduce suffering uh, of mankind. This, if, if, if I searched my deepest points, I would say everything starts and begins with that. Mm. In reducing the suffering 
in, 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 in educating the naive and, uh, and bringing, you know, some spirituality through our modern means, through this television set, through the radios, through the media, mm -hmm. th through cups and mugs, th through bed sheets, whatever. They are all media. They all expose mm -hmm. concepts. So when I even took all my drawings that I did and put them on bed sheets, you know, so many people would confuse and say it was such a commercial thing. Of course, there was a commercial thing involved in order for me to even be able to get the yeah. bed sheets. And I thought about the money probably at the least. Mm -hmm. I just wanted those big prints on giant sheets. It was the means. Yeah, it was so the media. So a nine-year-old boy who goes to sleep on a sheet on stars or something has a notion of something futuristic. Mm -hmm. It's like while we're living here on this planet, here and now, this very right now, some people are living in the future. I consider I, I'm, 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 I'm in the planet of the future. You are. <coughs> I, yes, I live in it. I dream of it. I think of it. I eat for that purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I just do futuristic things. And other people are still living in the past. Mm. So the future and the past are all here. You've said at some time in the past, the, world is, uh, the world's mood is right for my style. So you're not concerned about the, the fact that moods are ephemeral, that moods will change. If you're working in the future, you feel that your style will never go out of style, so yes. to speak. Is that right? It's as though you know that there is a future a future uh, a capsule somewhere in space in an astral plane and some someplace beautiful according to my imagination and I'm taking from that and I'm bringing it out here so I'm futuristic in my thoughts and I've learned timing living here mm -hmm. I've learned timing of how to bring it in how to bring these concepts in and make them work and that's why sometimes the commercialness comes in which is confusing to people who really do not know what my motives are you see, oh, it's commercial, capitalism, and so on and so. But that's secondary. It's just a means of getting this stuff out. Thank you very much, Peter Max. You're welcome. <laughs> ¶¶